really let me let her get that started okay perfect all right so we will go into our utilization edit recommendations then um, there is a new product, a risperidone injectable, Rakindo, comes in a 25, 37.5, and 50 milligram injectable. Its um, quantity limit that we're recommending is two per 28 days and age 18 years and older, consistent with the other injectable antipsychotics. Any questions or concerns with those? If not, if I could get a motion in a second, please. This is Carol, I move to approve. Seconded. Thank you, I will go through the voting then. Uh, Ms. Lugo. Uh, aye. Dr. Anderson. Aye. Dr. Knapp. Aye. Dr. Ott. Aye. Uh, not to put you on the spot, Dr. Powell, but we are voting for the Rikindo edits uh, up above there. So, okay, so you're approved. Yeah. Thank you. And then Dr. Rice. Sorry, I'm having keyboard shortcut issues. Approve. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, all approved. So that motion will carry. Just a couple of other um, PA updates. Um, so, mm -hmm. one FY, FYI, Amanda. the Rick. Yeah. I just got an email from Dr. Hilvershorn that she can't get into the SharePoint trying to join virtually. Is there a link? Can someone email that to her? Yes, I will have somebody email it right now. Okay. Thank you. So just as a FYI, the Rakindo is going to be added to the PA for duplicate therapy assessment in the antipsychotic PA. We automatically do that as new drugs are available. And then um, we did send over a PA for an update on the sedative hypnotic benzodiazepines PA, where we're adding some historical uh, look back for duplicate therapy with the chlorodase epoxide, clodinium, and then clobazam. But of kind of important note for the clobazam is we're going to automate looking for seizure diagnoses. So if they do have a seizure diagnosis and then are getting PRN Valium, say, or something else like that for their seizure, then that will bypass the edit and not... Um, require PA, and um, these will look for concurrent um, opiates as well, unless, again, it's a seizure diagnosis for clobazam. So, and then as far as the um, edit around, like, long-term use, et cetera, that those won't be included in that edit. So it's really just looking for the duplicate therapy or with opiates, unless they have a seizure diagnosis for clobazam. Any questions on that? Yeah, I know that that the this is Carol. Sorry, I know that the clobazam has a different is a one four instead of a one five or the other way around um, for benzodiazepines. But otherwise, um, are you just looking for like diazepam as needed, or what? I mean, why is specifically is that exempt from seizure diagnoses? Because we do right. have people that will get like will have. Um, like I said, PRN diastat or something like that okay. as they okay. need it or other PRN um, for status that they could okay. use together. Yeah, that's a pretty common thing that we see. So we don't want to restrict that. Um, but the idea is we don't, you know, if somebody's not using it for seizure diagnoses, it's probably not really recommended to be using clobazam and an, another like Ativan consistently or something like that. So I assume it doesn't, I mean, it's not easy to find as needed versus routine dosing for a duplicate. Is that what I'm hearing you say? It's not. So that's why we're using the seizure diagnoses. Okay. That makes sense. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or concerns? All right. If not, if I could get a motion in a second, please, for that. So moved. Second. All right, I have a motion and a second, so I'll start the voting. Ms. Lugo. Aye. And Dr. Andreessen. Aye. Do we have Dr. Holvershorn yet? Just checking really quick, I don't see her yet. Okay, um, Dr. Knapp. Aye. Dr. Ott. Aye. Dr. Powell. Aye. And Dr. Rice. Aye. 
All right, those were all ayes, so that motion will carry. Thank you. We will then go ahead and review our PA stats for July 1st through September 30th. Um, so here's overall our overall stats. We had around um, just a little over 37,000 that went through our silent off PAs and just a little over 29,000 were approved and a little over 8,000 denied. You can see those that then went to the call center after that for review. And I'll show our trending graph because I think that's a little more helpful when we're um, looking at this. So you can see for our antipsychotic therapy, we've really kind of leveled out after we made some of those updates, after we removed the 15-day edit and um, removed the um, low-dose edit in that PA. So we saw it drop pretty drastically in the April timeframe, and then since then it's kind of steadied out. So we're fairly steady at this point with that PA now. For the duplicate SSRI, SNRI, Fairly steady as well, a little bit of a decrease in this time period, um, but overall fairly steady with where we would expect nothing, um, no real big changes there. In the stimulants, also fairly steady. Um, we do see an increase, you know, starting in the May and June time, or we see a decrease starting in the June time period for people that are out of school, and then we start to see it pick up a little bit again when they go back to school. So fairly what we would expect to see here in the stimulants. And then for the sedative hypnotic benzodiazepines, also fairly steady with where we've been lately. Any questions on any of those before we move on to addiction stats? All right. For our opiates, um, you can see our opiate numbers there for the months, for three months there and the quarters. And I think it's, again, more helpful to look at the graph. So here's our trend overall. Um, you can see we have been trending a little bit upward from where we historically were. This is something that overall we're monitoring and evaluating, but I don't really have any great rationale at the moment, aside from we've talked about this as the DUR board is, you know, the pendulum swinging a little bit the other way with prescribers. We kind of really tightened down and then prescribers have kind of opened up a little bit again. So I think some of that may be happening um, and they do seem to be more in the lower dose range. Um, so we're just kind of continuing to monitor and see what that looks like. For our buprenorphine claims, um, you can see we've had kind of a steady increase overall since the April-May time period. Um, we do think this may be in some part related to the opening of the XDEA waiver and removing that. Um, so good, good things here, I think, that we're seeing. Um, you can see the other products, the injectables and the <clears throat> plain buprenorphine down at the bottom of the graph. So it's the buprenorphine naloxone at the top. Um, when we look at our overall opioid utilization reporting, um, we did have a slight increase in total opioid utilizers in August, but then had a decrease in new utilizers. So we had been having an increase in the new utilizers. So I think it's kind of coming back down and leveling out a little bit. Um, you can see the 18 years of age and under, it's been fairly steady and hanging about around five days for their utilization overall. And then you can see the breakout to the right and who is PA exempt. Um, I'm going to go to the trending graphs because I think that's, again, a little more helpful to see. So here you have anybody that's 90 and above. So the vast majority of our patients are, again, in the less than 90 and then the 90 to 120. And you can see kind of a smattering there than in the other groups. And then um, here's our trending overall down in the um, greenish colors, our current utilizers over 18, the cranberryish colors, our new utilizers, and then the purpley blue at the top is the current utilizers under 18 or equal to 18. So you can see this trend overall is continuing to increase just slightly. We are on a little bit of an upwards trend, but you can, but you do see, or I see at least in the August we had more new utilizers that then decreased in September. So leveling out a little bit there of our new utilizers. And then when we look at our overall less than 90 trending, you can see that it's trending on an increase. And I think this is where some of these new patients or kind of increase keeps coming from is in these lower dosing. Um, we've also speculated too that some of this may be like after COVID, we've had more elective surgeries that have been happening and orthopedic surgeries. So we might see increases in these kind of short-term periods as well. 
And then here's all the other trending um, for the other ranges. Um, as we would expect, we're seeing the lower doses, you know, or the higher doses stay lower or decrease as we move through the um, MME limits. And I think we're at what, 575 right now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So as of October 1st, I think we moved down to 575. So we're slowly but steadily making our making our way down. So it's been it's been going really well so far. Any questions on any of those? All righty. I will turn it over then to who has the pleasure of going through these slides today. Hey, Amanda. It's Brian. Hi, Brian. Can you can you hear me and see me? <laughs> I can. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Brian Musial on behalf of the MCEs to present the buprenorphine and the opiate slides. So uh, this first slide here, um, and before we get started, you know, I'd just like to remind everyone on each time that um, there are, currently are no PA requirements on buprenorphine products, except when someone exceeds the quantity limit. So the only thing that you're, you'll see in like PAs is related to someone who's at a high dose. Um, and then, um, you know, as we kind of watch this, this data is June through August in the most recent quarter. Uh, there is a little bit of potential impact from redeterminations and member changes, but um, just wanted to remind everybody about that. So slide number one here, this first one, uh, what you do see is a general decline in all five MCEs over the prior quarter. Um, in fact, most of the MCEs uh, had either their lowest month or lowest quarter over the last four or real similar to their lowest quarter over the last four. So uh, no surprises there. Uh, next slide, please. And this is uh, distinct unique members. And again, um, not much change here. And you see that sort of same similar slow decline in distinct members uh, that you saw with the claims. And the next slide is the prescribers. And this is sort of flipped a little bit, right? So most of the MCEs have seen an increase in their pres unique prescribers over prior quarter. So we have a few more docs in, in each one of them uh, prescribing, but uh, the claim counts are down. So we're seeing a little bit of a spread of that uh, product. And then last but not least is the PA slides number four. Uh, I do like to point out again, small numbers, right? Not a lot of PAs because they're only for exceeding that quantity limit. Um, and then uh, United Healthcare, we also like to point out they have a different scale because of their volume. So on the right, far right hand side, but again, nothing um, astonishing here. You do see a general decline uh, across all the MCEs. So any questions about those slides? Hey, Brian, this is Carol. I just have a question about, you mentioned there are no PAs. I just want to clarify in my own head. So for Pregnant people, there's no requirement to switch to buprenorphine anymore, right? And then to switch back postpartum? I believe you're correct. Okay, thanks. Yep. yep. Okay, um, then on to the opiates, uh, claims, and units. So there's three, three slides in this set, one for each of the programs. So the first one is HIP. Uh, on the left hand side is opiate claims per thousand members, and on the right is doses or units per thousand member months. And again, so this is HIP. You notice that the, the range is in the 30, 40, 50 uh, claims per thousand members and about 2,500 dosage units. And, you know, the trends are pretty steady and straightforward. Uh, not a lot of movement here. If you switch to the next slide, please, this is Hoosier Care Connect. So similar sort of trend lines. What I do point out here is the the numbers on the left you see are about twofold over the HIP population. So these folks are running in the 60, 80, 100 uh, units claims per thousand, and then uh, you know four, five, six, seven thousand <coughs> doses per thousand members. But again, in terms of the trends, they're pretty steady. And then last but not least, uh, Hoosier Healthwise, uh, very, very small numbers. So what looks like a little bit of change or movement in these graphs is, is attributed to the fact that these scales are very small. You're talking about only three claims per thousand members in these kids and somewhere between 100, 150 doses per thousand uh, member months. So very, very small volume and not a lot of change in most of this utilization. So any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Brian.
All right, next up we have Anthem. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yep, yep. Hi, Amy. Excellent. Um, as mentioned, my name is Amy Berger, and I am here to share Anthem's prior authorization updates. Um, on this first slide here, um, these are just going to be the actual values, which we know doesn't exactly give us a clear picture. So on the next slide, we will actually look at the trends. So here we have the PA volume represented by the bars um, with the corresponding y-axis at the left. And then we have the approval rates represented by the lines with that corresponding y-axis to the right. Um, so you may recall uh, for Anthem, we have been taking a phased approach to move our duplicate therapy edits to a hard edit. We started with antipsychotics and then moved to our antidepressants. Um, so what you'll see here, a number of those lines, especially that red line and that um, orange line, those downward trends that we're seeing um, are actually reflective of um, that duplicate therapy edit shift that we had. And what we're seeing, so with the, for example, the antidepressants, the SSRIs or SNRIs, um, where we initially saw that spike in approvals um, where we allowed for the titration from one agent to another. Um, and also we had those that were already established on duplicate therapy at the time we moved to the hard edit. Those were um, as expected, many of those were approved. However, um, with both the antipsychotics and the antidepressants, we the claims that we can or the requests that we continue to see um, are those for continuation on duplicate therapy, sometimes even beyond that initial approval. And what we're finding is that many times these requests that they're not actually titrating from one agent to the next. And we think this is quite possibly due to kind of the shift in process for Anthem specifically. So we're hoping um, in this next quarter or so that we will see these start to stabilize um, once they realize kind of the intent of that short term approval um, for that duplicate therapy to titrate from one to the other. And then the ongoing requests will just be um, those that truly should be maintained on that duplicate therapy. For all others, um, you'll see the, the PA volume remains relatively unchanged. It's really that SSRI, SNRI, the, the orange bars um, that saw that, that big shift with the implementation in um, between Q1 and Q2, and it continues to go up, as I mentioned. Um, the only other call out is the, the slight decrease in the green line that you see, and that's for the sedative hypnotics and benzodiazepines. And here, rather than the duplicate therapy, what we're continuing to see here, um, a large number of these requests continue to be for um, an anxiety indication. And oftentimes these are resulting in that denial as expected, um, having not met the the criteria that we follow the the state or the fee for service criteria. Are there any questions on the anthem data? Okay, thank you so much. Happy Thursday. Thanks, Amy. All right. Next up, we have uh, CareSource. Hi, Amanda. It's Beth. I just want to make sure okay. you can hear. I had to dial in by phone. So um, uh, good morning, everybody. So I'm going to talk again, kind of following Amy do, with the uh, duplication edits. I did want to uh, remind the committee, and we had discussed at the um, probably the last two, um, when CareSource came to market in 2017, we actually implemented a soft duplicate therapy edit, um, not realizing that the state had wanted a hard one. That means the pharmacist could override that edit and go ahead and allow therapy. Um, once this was clarified for us, we worked to put in this hard edit um, for these drug classes looking for duplicate therapy that's requiring a true prior authorization from the provider. Um, so we have definitely seen in this last quarter um, a, a significant increase in prior authorization. 
um, for members who um, are on duplicate therapy or they are titrating doses or potentially um, being discontinued off of one um, uh, drug and switching to another drug, but in the look back, it comes in as a duplicate therapy. Um, so what you're going to see is, Amanda, if you could go ahead and switch to the next slide for me. And we'll be combining all of our trend lines like Anthem was doing at the request of Anthem um, going forward. But for right now, I have these separated out. What you can see here is a, a, a significant jump and in increase in approvals. And again, that speaks to what Amy mentioned when they first put in their duplicate therapy edit is giving providers time to actually, um, you know, notice that there is duplicate therapy, that we need them to titrate the member to appropriate therapy and going ahead and allowing um, a shorter PA approval process. So our thought is, is we will see what Anthem sees over time and this will then level out and go back down. Um, so this is for the antipsychotics. If you um, go ahead and go to the next slide. And you'll see this again, duplicate with the SSRIs, SNRIs, we had that jump as well. Um, third slide, Amanda, in our, and then our stimulants, um, I don't know for, you know, for whatever reason, we really didn't see duplicate therapy. And perhaps that's because, you know, as the providers are writing for stimulants, it's so tightly managed being that controlled substance that um, we're just not seeing that, where that duplicate therapy of coming on one and off one. Um, but we're watching that to see what is going on as well. Um, so just to, just to let the committee know, there's been a lot of education for our PA department, our technicians and our pharmacists as we're transitioning through this duplicate therapy piece. Um, and the hard edit, because we, of course, wanna make sure we don't have a member or a patient go without appropriate medication and treatment. We don't want them just taken off of something and not titrated appropriately. So there's a lot of sensitivity. And again, so every other week, they actually have this on um, their morning meeting where they're going through it. They're reminding um, all of the staff that handles the Indiana cases what is going on, the sensitivity around it, and to ensure that we're taking the best care of the member that we can. I think that's my last slide, Amanda. Oh, no, one more. Um, the uh, sedative and hypnotic benzodiazepines. Um, we, again, we did see a slight increase here as we're working through those new edits that we have put into place, but we'll keep watching that um, for appropriateness, appropriate approval and appropriate denial. Now I think it's my last one. So does the committee um, have any questions for me? All right, thank you for your time. Thanks, Beth. Next up we have Cindy with MHS. Cindy? Hi, good, go ahead. can you hear me? They should be able to hear you, you're fine. All right, thank you. Good morning. Um, these are the PA stats for MHS. Um, there's not a whole lot of change except a little bit of uptick in uh, stimulants. Uh, we were in the mid-70s um, in Q1, so this is Q2 stats. And then I have the graphs afterwards. So as you can see, um, we have just a slight in that purple is a little bit higher for the reporting quarter for this meeting than it was from last. And again, we think that is to, uh, due to the start of school. And everything else is pretty much holding steady for PA trends. If we could go to the claim slide, please. And the claims are decreasing in three of our classes. We think that has to do with redetermination. So, um, you know, that is showing here. And then the um, antipsychotics had an uptick. We don't know um, if that's due to the fact that um, we've left off the 15 days or, you know, that has, was a full quarter of that, um, but that has gone up slightly. So we'll watch that next quarter, and then we'll look for some more trends if it continues to go up. Are there any questions for MHS? All right, thank thanks, you. Cindy. 
All right, looks like we have Nick speaking for MDWise. Nick? Yep, I'm here. Can you guys hear and see me? Yep, we can. Welcome. Perfect. Thank you. All right, so overall, um, in all categories, claims are also down for MDWise. Um, similar to MHS, we're attributing this to the um, eligibility redeterminations um, that began last quarter. Um, Antipsychotics here are still kind of leveling out um, after the first quarter changes this year, uh, but no big differences since last quarter. Next slide. Um, and then for the SSRIS and NRI, NRI agents, um, we still remain fairly consistent. Um, just again, have that trend of an overall decrease in total claims. Next slide. Thank you. Um, there are no changes to stimulants since the last meeting, but our PA approval percent went down about 9%. Um, this is likely due to an increase in the therapeutic duplication denials um, due to the continued stimulant shortages. And then next slide. Okay. And then sedative, hypnotic, benzos, and DORA agents. Um, again, we just see that overall decrease um, in total claims. Um, I think that was the last slide. Were there any questions for MD Wise? I don't have questions, but I wanted to add a few comments that are not only applicable to MD Wise, but all of the MCEs in that Nick mentioned drug shortages, but something else that may um, affect the PA rates for the MCEs, um, while there's no true PA requirement for AAAX drugs, the, I think we've all kind of struggled a bit with application of the preferred brand list in some of these categories <coughs> and um, provider understanding because that's a new concept for the MCEs. And so we're seeing some requests for generics when truly the brand is preferred based on the state's list. So, <clears throat> you know, it's hard for us to tease that out in the statistics, but if we see some weird trends or some increases, I think that could be an explanation as well. So like I say, Nick mentioned the stimulant shortages. Those have been a problem for us because we have to um, give quantity exception overrides and, and that sort of thing. So just wanted to mention it. That's all I have. Blankenship? Oh, you're on. Yeah, I spoke before Monica presented. Can you, oh, you're, no, you're funny. Yeah, we can hear you now. Good morning, everyone. Monica with uh, UHC, and I realized I put in the date that I submitted this to the state, so it is the 19th of October, not the 5th. It's going fast. Um, so right up here, I have the same slides that um, all the other MCEs presented for our antipsychotics. We, I just want a, a reminder to the board, we have a very small population, so we definitely see a little more um, zigzagging in our approval and denial rates because sometimes we just see, um, based on fluctuation of the time of year, so we actually did see a little bit of decrease across all of our categories for approval. And most of those is because they are duplicate edits, and I uh, monitor these very closely. Um, a big portion of these is because the provider is not um, having any attestation, especially in like antipsychotics or stimulants. There's nothing about um, de-seeing the other agents. Um, so like you see in the stimulants for ADHD, there was only 14 requests, so seven denials um, puts our percentage all the way down to 50% of approval. So I just want to call that out because, you know, one approval or denial really changes the numbers for us. Um, but really, we're seeing a lot of denials just because of um, duplication and there's no plans to discontinue um, the previous agent. So any questions for UHC? Okay, great. Thanks so much. Thanks, Monica. All right, next up on our agenda, then we have the standing agenda item for the wards and fosters guideline development and implementation update. So I know we have Dr. Holvershorn on as well as Dr. Kuhn. I'll, I'll let you guys fight over it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think things are going well, kind of status quo with the program. Um, I don't think there's a lot of new information to share. Okay, perfect. 
Um, we don't have anything new on the concurrent use of opiates and benzos, but does anybody else have anything that they would like to discuss at this moment in time regarding that? All right. Any public comment today? If you have public comment, you can shoot me a message in the chat box, raise your hand, start speaking. All right, I am hearing and seeing none. Any old business that we need to go over today? I'm hearing none. So we will move on to new business. I know Dr. Kuhn is going to be presenting a reporting update for you all, so we'll start with that. So Dr. Kuhn? So good morning. My name is Ann Kuhn. I'm one of the pharmacists with OMPP. Um, the reports presented to the Mental Health Quality Advisory Committee have remained unchanged for some time now. Um, so today we're wanting to propose potential updates to the reports um, presented each quarter. Um, just to review, fee-for-service and each of the managed care plans report their quarterly prior authorization statistics by drug class. Fee-for-service also provides um, statistics and data related to opioids and buprenorphine utilization. And then the MCEs combine and present their buprenorphine and opioid data. Uh, so goals for the proposed updates. Um, while the current reporting is overall similar, each plan reports in a slightly different manner with a varying number of slides and trending graphs, et cetera. So having consistency could aid in the ability to better compare the data between the plans. Um, additionally, some information is presented at multiple meetings, so MHQAC, DUR board, and therapeutics committee. By streamlining, um, we could prevent the duplicate reporting. Um, and then finally, the major goal for the updates would be to make the reporting more meaningful and interesting and potentially drive future initiatives. Um, reports could also be discontinued, sunset, or updated um, after a designated period of time if the trends are or are not identified. So updates for prior authorization reporting. fee for service and the individual MCEs would continue to provide their quarterly prior authorization statistic tables. However, update to one condensed trending graph, including prior authorization information for all drug classes as illustrated in the slide. And then for reporting updates related to addiction, uh, we propose continuing to to MHQAC and move the opioid utilization reporting to DUR board only. The MHQAC began receiving opioid utilization reports in April of 2014. Um, this was related to updating the opioid um, overutilization rule to incorporate a check for concurrent buprenorphine uh, therapy. The rule was updated, but we've just continued to report until present. Um, and then the next bullet, um, updating fee for surface buprenorphine reporting to be consistent with that of the combined MCE report. So start incorporating um, unique member, unique provider, and prior authorization data. And um, then the last bullet, MCEs would include long acting injectable buprenorphine in their combined reporting. And then on to the new reporting. We propose uh, tracking trends and utilization by age range for both antipsychotic and stimulant therapy. Um, earlier this year, compendia age edits were incorporated into the IHCP antipsychotic criteria. The tracking could help direct additional interventions that may be needed uh, related to appropriate prescribing. Regarding the stimulant tracking, um, the CDC reported an increase in stimulant prescribing from 2016 to 2021, um, particularly 2020 to 2021. Uh, and they had found an increase in stimulant fills of more than 10% in females age 15 to 44 and males 25 to 44. So tracking here, we could determine if um, this is consistent in our member population, and if so, drive potential criteria updates. Uh, the age breakouts for each uh, class is, is listed here. Um, just one item to note, there, there were some updates made to the Support Act antipsychotic monitoring requirements. Um, so beginning January 1st of 2024, the reporting requirements will include um, usage in individuals over the age of 65. And then we would also like to um, propose adding some adherence reporting. 
fee-for-service currently has the capability to report on medication adherence related to conditions um, of depression and psychosis. Um, the adherence data looks at percent of days covered, or PDC, in which um, members with 80% PDC would be considered adherent. Um, illustrated are examples of what the proposed adherence data would look like. It includes the percent adherence, the number of utilizers, and then also the change from previous reporting period. Uh, we're also looking into the potential to build additional adherence reporting with medications for opioid use disorder um, being one area of interest. And then as far as implementation plan, uh, we plan to have the updates for the January 2024 MHQAC meeting, uh, reporting on Q4 2023 data. Just to note, the MCEs would continue to report on the offset quarter, as they do currently. Um, for the newly proposed reports, we would plan a sunset after one year or modify or continue, um, depending on what the data illustrates. So is there any questions on this input? I like changes. Thank you. Makes a lot of sense. Anything else anybody thinks would be valuable to track? I know when when I um, did some of our SUPDL research, Vyvanse was the number one prescribed drug across the entire program, and, the, and it was both for children and for adults. So um, that concerns me a touch. So um, that's, that's kind of where the, the interest in looking at stimulants comes from, and then the support act changes. But I know we, we just kind of trudge through the same slides every quarter. So if there's anything else anybody thinks is, is pertinent, we can certainly add. Um, anything, anything. Is there anything we should look at with regards to LAIs in general, not just the opioid LAI, we'll look at the other psychotic LAIs? We broke out that data mm -hmm. separate? Yeah, we could do that in the antipsychotic section, break out LAIs. MCEs, do you think that's are, are well MCE is this just fee for service reporting or both, both, both of them? Do, are okay. you when you suggest that are you wanting that around PAs or would you like to see like claim count like percentages of oral versus LAIs? That, right. Yeah. yeah that, I mean if we get all the way down to like outcomes measures, that would be great, but I don't know what you're <laughs> <laughs> Hey Amanda, can they Speak, see, this is Beth. Can we speak up a little bit or into a mic? I'm having a difficult time hearing. Yeah, so Dr. Knapp suggested that we provide um, a breakout of like claims for LA long acting injectable antipsychotics versus the oral agents and being able to evaluate the percentages of use there. I can tell you in, a, in another state, we have an initiative, actually a close state to us has, has an initiative around LAIs. It's kind of a multifocal initiative that we're working with them on. So when we have some outcomes there, it'll be really interesting to bring it back here to see how those things worked well for them. They have some other differences though in that they don't allow pharmacists to administer or they don't pay a dispensing fee or administration fee for that. So they have some barriers for sure, but I think it'll be interesting to see what change they've been able to realize in dispensing between those two that we can definitely bring back here as something to look at for future use for us, sure. how successful it is. Yeah, I think that would be great. We we finally were able to go live with our program at CareSource where if we have a recent hospitalization um, due to a mental health issue, needing um, an antipsychotic, we are encouraging LAIs and working directly with the provider. So we're starting to track that data now for that program to see hopefully potential increase in quality of care and positive outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. From my point of view, the LAIs are expensive, but so are hospital stays. Yeah. And yeah. theoretically, yeah. it makes a lot of sense to me, but 
let's get some objective data rather than just subjective. There was a recent study too that just, um, and I don't remember exactly who it is by off the top of my head, but they did find that LAI initiation actually at diagnoses of schizophrenia yeah. had improved outcomes over oral therapy. So improved outcomes, not only in adherence, but also improved in um, suicidality, suicide risk, actual suicide, mortality in general, and hospitalizations just at initiation. So, you know, oftentimes we think about initiating oral and then LAIs, but the study was kind of looking at what if we initiated LAIs right away. So I think there's definitely a lot more compelling data showing that, yes, they're more expensive, but if they're helping us in their health outcomes long term, we're saving money. Yeah, for sure. But the drug companies would fully support that. <laughs> But you guys should have the hard I promise data. I have no interest there. You guys, should, you guys should have the data to prove it yeah. one way or the other. Right. This, this is Dr. Rice. This if, is if, oh, we are, if, if we're going to track this, would it is it possible to also track um, presentations either to outpatient or emergency settings um, related to some of the adverse effects that we can see that, that are more difficult to manage with LAIs because somebody now has continued exposure to the agent for a prolonged period. So so just kind of anecdotally, I feel like I've seen more, I mean, I, I am a, a wholehearted enthusiast about LAIs in many cases, but I feel like I've also just clinically seen more people presenting um, with prolonged periods of disabling akathisia, um, a, a couple cases of NMS, things like that in, in patients who have received LAIs. Um, and obviously the management of that becomes much more complex uh, than it is for, for an acute exposure to an oral agent. We um, could, so this, this, would, this is Beth, can I just, jump on to her comment about the medical side and looking at those presentations. Um, just what I was going to wonder is after we have this discussion, if we could all come back um, often in the NCEs in the office to talk about what we could pull together, because some of it has to do with when medical claims come in and what that lag is. And so what would the reporting look like? So we would have our pharmacy reporting, but then we would have potential claims maybe on the medical side. And then if we add in um, what you were just talking about, we would definitely have lag on pulling that. So that's just that caveat as we're talking here. Yeah, Beth, so one, one of the things I can tell you, at least on the fee-for-service side, and I don't know what it's like on the MCE side, but we have looked at the difference between what antipsychotics long-acting are going through medical and pharmacy, and it's been minuscule that go through medical so the vast majority for us goes through pharmacy benefits so it's I we, think she's talking about the complications right with the complications too so I think that's going to be a little bit difficult to know like if they're linked together but one of the things that maybe we could pull that might we might be able to make some inferences from because the data that we're seeing we're not necessarily going to be able to immediately go, okay, yeah, they started this LAI and then they got this and, and we can take all those inferences because we won't have all that data to really look at that. But we might be able to pull kind of diagnoses of akathisia or other um, movement disorder diagnoses and then pull that in the LAIs versus orals to see like percentages of diagnoses that we're having and maybe we could kind of look at some of that too as something to evaluate which might be a little bit easier to get to and then make some inferences on. Yeah. Um, what about those members? This is Cindy, Cindy Yuri with MHS. What about those members who start the Ingresa, um, the, that therapeutic uh, class of medication? That too, therapy? yeah. That would be easier to pull, possibly. Sure, we could definitely pull in those members as well. Hey, Amanda, so I, I feel like I have to jump on the bandwagon with questions because, I mean, for a long time... <laughs> We've looked at LAIs and Dr. Helvershorn knows, remembers how we thought about like some of the long acting injections in adolescents. But the other concern that I have is the high dosing, um, a potential unintended consequence of pushing people toward LAIs without some kind of guardrails is that, I mean, I, I routinely see people on, on for example, in Vegas Astena, 
high dose, um, like 234, without a good process to see how they got there, or people essentially double decked. And so, I mean, I, I am, I agree with others that, you know, this LAIs, there's a lot of good data around their long term effectiveness, but there, but I also think there needs to be some evaluation of what kind of guardrails could be in place so that we just don't have people on high dose LAIs which then becomes a long-term management problem for um, increased risk of those side effects that we're talking about. So we could potentially pull, when we look at those claims for LAIs versus oral, we could pull down a breakdown of dosing of the LAIs just to see who's on the high percentage. Courtney's looking at me because oh, Stephanie's probably on the phone dying inside right now, but that's she'll get over it. But we could... <laughs> We could pull data around that just to see the per, and even if all we do is pull the highest dose to see how many patients we have on high dose versus the other doses, just to have an idea of what we're looking at. So, and let me ask too, are we wanting this to be done at the MCE level or would OMPP do it with, you know, like the... Where? I think we could do it, we could do it as a one-time report out, um, but if it was something that was going to be routine, it would be, data pulls for us are extremely difficult and not particularly accurate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This sounds like a good candidate for a retrograder. Uh, oh, yeah. A yeah, that's a good idea. Retro. So, that would be a suggestion. Yeah, I think knowing the data in advance would help us know what our next step would be. Yeah. Oh, do we have, it, are we done with? How many D retro DURs do we have to do yet for this year? Are we done? So would it be next year? It would be next year, okay. yeah. Do we, is, at the end of the year. is there, and I may have missed this um, in the conversation, but the oral overlap, I mean, some of it's required, but I also am seeing more than, um, more than expected folks who are um, put on like oral paliperidone or oral antipsychotic in combination with something like in vagus astena because there's some some idea out there that you can boost the effectiveness of in vagus astena if you oral overlap with it. Um, and the, the pharmacokinetic data doesn't really support that. So my concern is once they leave a hospitalization that they're on longer term oral overlap um, of another antipsychotic, which kind of defeats the purpose of the LAI. So is that something else to consider? Would that be, does that hit duplicate therapy for us? No, because they're the same ingredient. Oh. And, they, and there is sometimes, some people do need some required overlap or have some, a period of where they need overlap. So, um, it but if would. it's overlap for longer than 30 days, that's just, I mean, right. there, that would cover every LAI. And in the case of, in Vegas Astena, because of the, if you do the load and boost, you don't need that oral overlap. I mean, this would be a rare case that I think would need that, but I keep seeing it more and more. It should come across like as a DUR edit to where they would see it in DUR, but they could over, you know, the pharmacist or whoever could just easily override that because it's not a hard reject. Right, that's what I was gonna say. We're not, we don't have any of those that is hard. Same. Their duplicate therapy soft reject for yeah, us in fee for service. The reason why this had taken up a little bit of the retrograde is we're seeing kind of what Dr. Ott is describing as inappropriate utilization. That might be, a, you know, something that then we could move forward with some sort of change. It just, it, mm -hmm. again, would depend on what the data show. Mm -hmm. So we can, if if, uh, if this group wants to do a retrograde, what we can do is then we can take that to the DUR board and say that the MHQAC has requested a retrograde, give them a vague idea of what we're talking about, and um, get you know get their buy-in, which I know they will <coughs> because Carol's on board. <laughs> we can. Ah uh -huh, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> What, you mean I can swing a stick and they'll do it? Is that what you mean? I'm saying you're influential. <laughs> okay, thanks. I appreciate that. Uh, I think let's look at what we can bring in January as data first, and then we can assess from there. 
what what we have going on and where we have where we have the issue. Anything else or any other suggestions to look at? All right, I'm hearing that. I don't, you, did you want to vote for your reporting? I don't, th I don't think we need one, but I'm, I will defer to you all. And I mean, I didn't hear any strong objections. Yeah, so I, I would just say, if you there's no objections. Yeah, if there, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other new business before we cover the agenda for the next meeting that we need to discuss today? Man. All right, I'm hearing none. So for the agenda for the next meeting, we'll have all of the standing agenda items with the new reporting to be covered then. Any other new agenda item that we need to add for the next meeting? All right, I'm hearing none for that as well. So we'll carry over our standing items. That takes us to our last item, Ms. Lugo, of adjournment. We're adjourned. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much you, everybody. for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you.